My name is Aldo Fiori, I'm a professor at the uh, Roma Teo University of Italy and uh, this video is uh, part of the uh, time capsule uh, uh, program of the International Association of uh, Other Geologists. And uh, um, the protagonist of this uh, video is uh, Gideon Dagan, uh, who is here and uh, uh, professor emeritus at Tel Aviv University. I don't think uh, Gideon is uh, some sort of introduction, so he's very well known and that's the reason why he's here. And uh, so I would like to start immediately this conversation by uh, starting with your uh, autobiography, which was published in 2009 in Groundwater. And there you mentioned about uh, uh, your early interest in science in high school. So I'm curious to hear from you uh, when did it start and what was the motivation of your choice. Uh, OK, it's true. Uh, in high school, I uh, had an inclination for mathematics. I must say that. I was a good high school student, and I found it quite easy uh, to study. And uh, so, in fact, when I was not in school, I devoted my time not to mathematics or to physics or things like that, but to literature mostly. Uh, but in, in, in class, I was pretty good in mathematics. What happened, something uh, quite uh, important at that point, was that we got in and I was in the uh, one before the last class. We got a new teacher of mathematics. And uh, he was in his 50s, I think. And it turned out he was a university professor of astronomy. Mm. And because we were in a communist country, he was kicked out of the university because of political reasons, which might be very mild, not something serious. And he was moved to high school. So what you would expect from such a guy is that he becomes bitter and uh, neglects his duties. But it was the opposite. He was very enthusiastic, and he liked to teach us high school students. But he, his, his classes were marvelous. He made mathematics really very attractive. He also realized quite soon that I am good at it. And he even jokingly called me Princeps Mathematicorum, which in Latin means, of course, the prince of <laughs> mathematics. And this was nickname for Gauss. So it was <laughs> really a joke. Uh, what he did, besides being a very good teacher, he opened a kind of extra course in the afternoon without credits, only for those kids who were interested on rational mechanics like Newton law and including differential calculus, which we didn't study. So he, this had a great impact on, on my development. And I was surprised completely that a couple of weeks ago, I, there is a program on Israeli TV in which a guy interviews Nobel laureates. And he interviewed an economist from Princeton at Institute for Advanced Studies, who told him exactly the same story. I mean, that his teacher of mathematics in high school had a very great impact on his nice. development. So I felt myself in very good company. Uh, so this was uh, uh, the way I got interested in, uh, not interested, but I liked very much mathematics in my high school. and. A large extent due to, prof to my teacher, whose name was Luca Teodoriu. I see. So uh, later, I, uh, I see that you uh, you st started studying uh, uh, hydrotechnical engineering uh, by the civil engineering department. And uh, so, what was the, the motivation of choosing such a particular field? Uh, uh <laughs> yeah. Here, here I have to expand a bit the explanation and to talk about the stage in history we were in that time in Romania, it was a communist regime. And I was a Jew, of course. Uh, I am a Jew. And uh, Jews uh, were uh, the chances for Jews to work after graduation were uh, not so wide. And uh, so Jews who went, young Jews like myself, who went to study in the universities, uh, chose 
very professions which I were not political, like all my friends, and they are here in Israel, are either engineers or doctors, and one maybe one or two physicists. But most are either engineers or doctors, because we knew with this profession we could find jobs without having to prove our political uh, credentials. Uh, this was one reason. Now, so, when the choice was limited, for me it was clear I will go to engineering. Also, my father was an engineer, so somehow it was in the family. Uh, maybe I should have gone to physics or mathematics <laughs> in uh, looking, but uh, those were professions which, which, in which there is much, it was more difficult to find a job. Engineer, doctor, it was easy, it was demand. Then, there is another fa important factor, is that I was Zionist. I wanted to immigrate to Israel and to live there. In fact, I regarded Israel as my true uh, country or fatherland, let's call it. And uh, so I was also thinking about a profession which will be uh, useful to Israel. And I heard that Israel had water problems. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I want to be an engineer, and I want to do something which, so let me go to study hydrotechnical yeah, engineering. So I, in 51, I was admitted, after an exam, entrance exam, I was admitted uh, there and started my studies. Your studies. So, and, uh, and in parallel also you studied mathematics, right? For, uh, yeah, but what, what before that, yeah, before that, maybe I say a few words on the nature of study in, in engineering. Yeah. So this was like in the communist regimes, very special at faculties. So this was faculty of hydrotechnical engineering within the Institute of Civil Engineering of Bucharest. And um, the studies were somehow different from <coughs> what is uh, common in USA or even in Israel, because we more or less are oriented the same lines, maybe not so different from Italy. First of all, to finish engineering, we have to study five years. It was not BSc engineering, it was engineer. Yeah, it was the same. Yeah, four and a half years of study and half year for a project, a final project. The second thing was, we were a group, and we were a group which started from zero to the end. I mean, there are no electives. We couldn't move between courses, among courses. We were like in an army a regiment moving ahead. And um, this had some advantages because we become, became friends. We people are still meeting, you know. Whereas in the present system here, people are electives. They are moving. They are not the same. You are not. A, together with the same people all right. these years. They are still, uh, but not the way we were. The other thing is that uh, it was very much frontal teaching. We had every day six, seven hours. So uh, the need to do homework was not too, too uh, serious, except the exam period in which we were studying from morning to evening. But otherwise, uh, afternoons were more or less free, and I employed them to go to concert, to opera. To I, I, I didn't have to spend too much time. Also, I was a good student, so I could, didn't have to spend too much time. Last, point I want to, uh, last two points I want to make about these studies. The teachers were good. They accept the basic uh, subjects like mathematics, physics. They came. They were, came from design institutes. They were not scientists. They were not researchers. By the way, there is very little research in the, in the university. Research was done outside in uh, institutes of the academy. So these people were practitioners. But they were, uh, let's say, uh, senior people. And they were teaching like strengths of materials, elasticity, uh, hydraulics. But their main profession was to work in application, in design. And this had advantages, of course, because they were 
uh, quite motivated. They want to prove themselves as, as uh, lecturers, as professors, and uh, uh, they knew what was the aim of the studies. I mean, it was not theoretical. Uh, last point was because it was communist regime, we also got courses in Marxism, Leninism, which we didn't take seriously, but they took part of our time. And we are very careful when talking about things which had the slightest political. We have to be very careful. There were always an informer, one or two informers among us. So we are not touching. Uh, and of course, we addressed each other and also our professor comrades. I see. Comrade Aldo. <laughs> <laughs> Camarade. <laughs> So this is about um, my studies in engineering. Now let's go to my studies in applied mathematics and mechanics. Romania had a, a system which I think was very good. The university, not the engineering institute, but the university where people study mathematics, physics, and so forth, created a special program for, uh, let's say, the best students in engineering. From in Bucharest, there were some few schools of engineering, electronics, mechanics, there were different schools. So there were thousands of students. Best of them, the ones who, who got the best uh, grades, could take in parallel from the second year, in parallel, uh, a degree in either physics or applied mathematics, which I took. And we were a very small group, something like 15 people from all, from the thousands. Not only that we had to prove our uh, cap capability, but we had to be interested because it's uh, extra effort. Now, the classes were in the afternoon, they didn't overlap. So we have special classes that didn't overlap with us, our uh, engineering classes. And the exams were in different periods. So. And this was a very good experience because I got uh, my mathematics in. Already in the first year in engineering, I, I, I was very much interested in mathematics. I read beyond the courses like uh, uh, vector fields, things like that. And then I got very good uh, and a serious dose of mathematics and also fluid mechanics. A very advanced course in fluid mechanics by well uh, a professor known also in, in the West. His name was Caius Jacob, and he has a very fat book of hydrodynamics. I have it in my office with a lot of uh, very mathematical. And it was, he was a non polite mathematician. He was translated in French, I think. So this was a story. Of course, I worked much more than uh, just taking engineering, but it was not so difficult, and I was much interested. And in 1956, I finished both f uh, five years of engineering and four years of applied mathematics. And after that, uh, did you start to do immediately do research? Or, uh, not or immediately, but before finishing. So now maybe. Uh, will move uh, to my professional career. But uh, before doing that, uh, what happened was that in the last year, one of our assistants was the chief of a laboratory, hydraulic laboratory, not belonging to the university, no. but doing, I'll talk about it later a bit, doing, and he, he realized that I am more open, more advanced than my colleagues. I knew a lot of mathematics more than others. So he told me, look, if you want, I want you to come to work for us when you finish. But if you want, you can start already in the last half year when I'm working on the project to work for us. And this was uh, very good for two reasons. First. I, I knew already that I want to work in research. I mean, this was after getting so much mathematics, physics, uh, not so much physics, mechanics, uh, uh, fluid mechanics. I, I, I knew I don't want to go now uh, to work uh, in design or on, on, on a site, you know. 
So for me, it was a good offer. Besides, many people were had to go outside Bucharest to go to a remote place to work. Sent, uh, and this was in Bucharest, so I had could stay in, in uh, at home in the capital. So I started, uh, and uh, maybe when we move to our next uh, stage, I'll tell a bit more about that. So, uh, uh, so essentially, you then you moved to to Israel, right? And no, no, no. Not yet. There uh, was so you spent this six years before, six years. Oh, and six years altogether before moving. Before moving, oh, oh, and then I had beginning of a professional career, which we can talk about a bit. Yeah. So uh, after graduation, essentially. So what was your career? I mean, uh, yeah. which kind of studies you uh, yeah. your research you you started? Uh, in which field, uh, particular yeah. field? Yeah. Yeah. That we are talking about three years. So this is not one day. So I worked as a researcher engineer in a big institute of hydrotechnical research. Now, why do I say big? Because it was a very big area, hall. And the main job of this institute, it had different departments, but the department I was in, was building models of rivers and hydrotechnical constructions. Physical models? Yes. Uh -huh. So it was big and this, yeah, These laboratories were very common at the time. And in each country, there was at least even one. Italy, there were many. Yeah, one of them is in Delft, which I think even yeah. today does this type of work. In France, there was Grenoble. Mm -hmm. In uh, England, Wallingford. Wallingford. I think in Italy it was in Rome, but I'm not sure. There were a few. I mean, uh, yeah. But generally, there was a big one which was known everywhere, and maybe a big country, large countries, even more. So, and this. The job there was essentially because there was development of river uh, regulation, you know, also building hydrotechnical, hydroelectrical plants. And there are a lot of hydraulic structures like a dam and spillways and channels. And uh, so the, uh, there were the physical models built in the huge hall. You can see in all these laboratories. Um, they have also vertical structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I joined uh, this institute. And here, I, again, I was lucky in a sense. I guess it's not pure luck, but because I had that background, I was not given just the job, which is not a kind of, let's say, a routine job to run such a model, you know. To, to, we had technicians who made measurements, and the engineer was supposed, first of all, to design and then to to interpret this measurement, to change things, you know, that what the way you did it, by trial and error, to see what happens. Uh, they, they are putting sand, and you could see scoring, scores. Yeah. But I didn't get such a job. They decided that I'm, I can get some special jobs, not the regular ones. So I had three or four projects during that period. And I can mention them, because one of them is related to Italy. I think the first one was about uh, water intake in the mountains. You have a big tunnel which conveys water to the hydroelectrical plant, uh -huh. to the penstocks. But on the way, this is maybe 10 kilometers going through the mountains, on the way you want also to capture some small streams. So how uh -huh. do you do that? You build a shaft, like a piezometer. Yeah. And on the top, it has a round spillway, and water is falling inside. And the water in that piezometer, in that shaft, is, of course, dictated by the uh, head in the system. So it was maybe 20 meters above the, the big tunnel, and some 10 meters below ground, something like that. Now, what happened was the water was falling into that shaft, yeah. and then joining the main flow in the tunnel. When the water fell, bubbles were created. It was mixing into and bubbles. And they were afraid that these bubbles can be entrained into the oh, tunnel. Yes. And they didn't want that, because they could reach the turbines and all kinds of problems. Yeah. So the question was, are these bubbles, is the section 
which is full of water, long enough for the bubbles to, because the bubbles were rise, raising fast, relatively fast, relative to the current. So there was enough space there for the bubbles to be. So my job was to in investigate this problem. But experimentally or? Uh, no, theoretically no, or? theoretically first. I did the theoretical work. Then they did some experiments. So what did I have to do was to read about bubbles and raising rise of bubbles in water. Now, that's an interesting topic, which colleagues of mine here are still studying because they studied two-phase flow, yeah. water and air, and so forth. And it's a classical problem of fluid mechanics, which is still very interesting. So I had to read. And I found in a journal called Energia Elettrica, yeah. which is a Italian journal, at the time it was very good. I don't know today what happened to it. No, well, no, because uh, it's in Italian, and they they had they were related to the hydrotechnical uh, to hydroelectrical development of Italy, which was also very energetic at the time. And they published good. There was a review on bubbles. I don't remember the name of the author. Something with B, Bagnoli, but I don't remember. It, we are talking 50 years ago, almost. Yeah, <laughs> you were not born at the time. Anyway, so, but it was in Italian. So I realized that Italian and Romanian are very close. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sure uh, after the two pages, I could read without using a dictionary. Mm -hmm. And it was very useful to me. And then I saw very interesting studies. He, he did a very good job. Not theoretical, just giving, you know, results and uh, relationship between the uh, how are these bubbles looking? You know, they are very small; they are spherical. Then they become uh, when they are larger, they have the shape of a mushroom, mm -hmm. leaving behind them a wake. So, this was my first project. Later on, I will tell you that uh, I did some work later, much later, in seventy. Uh, in the 69, 70, and I published a paper in General Fluid Mechanics about the stability of the tip of the bubble. Ah, I see. So but this is much later. So this is one project. Another project was uh, about uh, sideware in which water is flowing into a channel from the side, and uh, you have a free, uh, free surface flow, channel flow, and the discharge is increasing with distance. And to how to calculate the profile. Yeah. And on that, uh, and then another topic was about uh, intake, water intake by grills. Yeah. You have a grill on the bottom, and again it captures the water, <coughs> and you have a free surface which is of decreasing discharge, because part of the discharge goes down and the, the free surface reaches the grill. Uh, these were projects, ah, the last project was <laughs> completely different. It was about the launching of ships sideways. Because if you have a shipyard in a river, on a river and not in, on the ocean or the sea. In the sea and the ocean, we all know how it looks. They go long, uh, long side and then they get in the water on a rail and they get in the water and start to, f to, to float here they were launched sideways because the river is too shallow. And they want to know, again, if it won't hit the... F this was a physical model in which ah, I had... Okay. So this one was a yeah, a small model. ship launched and I had... But still needed to interpret this in a different way than um, other models. And uh, to finish this story, uh, I published from these works, I published in Romania my three my first three articles were published in the local technical journal called Hydrotechnica in Romanian, or Hydrotech, Hydrotechnics. And um, so these were my first publications. And all this reached an abrupt end in 1959, February, because at that time I was arrested, because of political reasons. and. Uh, I was in prison for eight months, which was also very 
profound experience, but it's not the object of this, uh, of this conversation. When I was liberated, because it was, I didn't do anything very wrong, it was politically wrong, but not, uh, uh, let's say, something uh, uh, which uh, was uh, common uh, uh, law or something like that. And then I couldn't find a job, I couldn't work again in research, and I did some not so interesting jobs. I worked like an engineer on a site, supervising, uh, measuring, and uh, so two years of my career are like a big lull, are absent from my CV. I see it's a jump. Of two years of together, it's professional. Three years, three years. Also, I'm not putting my uh, uh, prison time <laughs> in my CV. CV. So in 59 to 62, there is a jump, and then in February 62, again February is a uh, month which is uh, crucial in my life, I got eventually uh, a permit to leave Romania for Israel, and mind you, the first time I asked for such a permit was in 1950, so it took 12 years. 12 years. Ooh. Because Romania was a big prison, big prison, like any country in the East, Eastern Europe and the, and the Soviet Union. And uh, it was a matter of luck or of waves. And then I got and I left Romania for Israel. So this finishes our first chapter. Nice. So in 62 you moved to, to Israel. Uh, and uh, so where did you go and uh, which institution, which kind of work you started at the time? And uh, okay, of course in Romania, because I was in research, I was very, and I wanted very much to leave Romania for many reasons, but you already heard about two. Uh, I, I was curious about what will be my chances in Israel. And uh, the only occasion in which I, I fell upon a reference was uh, an article in a journal called La Ville Blanche. Mm -hmm. Like in Energia Electrica, it was very well known. well known in France, but again, now it is completely forgotten, I mean, because it's almost. a local journal, almost. <laughs> so, and La Ville Blanche was in the library, and then I saw an article by professor, I, I don't think even he was a professor at the time, his name was Irmai from Hydraulics Laboratory of the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. So that's the only place I knew about, and in fact it was the only place at the time, where hydraulic research was carried out. So after my arrival, I, I was in Tel Aviv. After my arrival, <clears throat> I went to Haifa to find out if I can get a job. And uh, again... But did you have any connection before or just you went there? I didn't have any connection. In fact, somebody <coughs> arranged for me a connection with a professor in materials who was from Romania. And, and he knew people in the hydraulics lab. So he met me and took me to the hydraulics lab, but just delivered me. He, he didn't intervene in my favor. Just uh, talked to this guy. and. Uh, I didn't mention, but I studied Hebrew in Romania, so when I came to Israel, I spoke Hebrew quite well. Mm -hmm. A bit too literary, you know, not, I didn't know slang, but I was, so this was not a problem. And also my English was not bad. So, not so much to speak, but I could read. So I got to the hydraulics lab, which again was a big hall in which there are a few models, and the towing tank. And the guy whom I met first was sitting on the towing tank. His name was Elata. He became a friend. He was already in the academic staff, young guy. He told me, look, I don't have work for you. But there is another young senior lecturer here who just two years ago came from his PhD in USA. His name is Jacob Baer. Mm -hmm. And I know he has a project, and he's looking for a research engineer. So go and talk to him. 
And then I met Bear, who was really at the beginning of his career. He returned from USA, where he, uh, he studied for a PhD with David Todd from Berkeley. Uh -huh. Maybe, so you are oh, young. Man, I'm in the video of the Yeah, you <laughs> had, yeah, he had about Todd. And he was very energetic. He was, and he got a project. He got a project from Tahal. Tahal was a, a big design firm in Israel, water, government owned. Because Israel has a lot of water development at the time, and they were doing all the design. Uh, in the meantime, they were privatized. And they also had work abroad in Africa, in, in Iran, mm -hmm. in uh, different countries. And they got a project from FAO, we, the Food and Agriculture Organization of UN from Rome, the headquarter in Rome, about a coastal collector. Now, the coastal collector idea was to catch fresh water in the coastal aquifer oil, which moves and is discharged in the sea, to catch it just near the sea by introducing a drain. So to get fresh water, but without causing the interface or the saltwater body to move in, in a, just to catch it before. And uh, Tahal designed and also supervised the building of a pilot of that in Israel. And Bear got a, a chunk of that project to do research on it. What will happen to if, uh, where to put this drain so to catch only fresh water and not salt water? So it is, they call it skimming, to skim the fresh water. And uh, so he got the project, and he, when he found that uh, I had a good uh, mathematical background, he asked me to work on it. Of course, I didn't have background in flow support media, neither on uh, groundwater or hydrology. But because I had that, uh, solid background in mathematics, in mechanics, and some experience in research, I could start immediately. So I got this position two months after uh, arriving in Israel, which was a kind of record time, because most people, it took much longer. They had to learn the language to get mm -hmm. used, and so forth. Here I could start quite early, and I moved to Haifa. And uh, I started to work on, on this project. And uh, uh, quite uh, quickly, I uh, got onto a topic which, in which my mathematics worked well. It was about using the holograph method in order to calculate the, look, the position of, of the interface in two dimensions. So a fixed interface, salt water resting beneath, and uh, above it, fresh water flowing, and uh, heavy use of complex variables, sharp interface approximation, heavy use of complex variables in which I had a very good course in my mathematical studies. And uh, so uh, already uh, a paper uh, of, uh, the first paper was published in, uh, in uh, Journal of Geophysical Research in 1964 on the holograph method, with Bear, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was cited 62 times from that time, oh. and three times in 2, two one, 11. So last year, it was cited three times. So this paper survived almost 50 years. And I myself went back to that when we reached towards the end of this, maybe, uh, if we'll have time to. I went back to this with my student, PhD student, uh, Amir Pastor, who, who built on that paper on similar ones uh, to study mixing. At that time, it was a fixed interface. Now, uh, maybe a few more uh, words about the Technion at that time. Technion was until uh, the 50s. Uh, they call it in German Technische Hochschule, which means the technical high school. Of course, it was university, but very much created by 
professor who came from Germany. And the beginning in the 20s, they taught in German. And it was very much a technical school. And only at the beginning of the 50s, there was a revolution. At the end of the 40s, when the state of Italy was created, the Technion moved into being a research university, much more built along American model. And this revolution was physical. They moved in a new campus, brand new campus, which was built on the mountain, uh, on the Carmel Mountain. And one of the first academic vice presidents, which is like a rector, was a very well-known fluid mechanicist, uh, Jew, but American and Brit, Brit England, from England, who moved to Harvard. His name was Sidney Goldstein. Maybe you have heard about him. He very well-known before the Second World War and afterwards and worked in uh, boundary layers, viscous flow, and so forth. And he was at Harvard, and he was mobilized by the president of the Technion to come and to create the master plan for developing Technion along the lines of a modern American research university. And one of the things he, he did, which was very wise, he uh, arranged for young the brightest students to be sent for PhDs in USA on the account of, with a fellowship from the Technion. So simultaneously tens, maybe tens, something like that, of young people were sent to USA and he had very good connections to different universities. And that's the way Bear got to oh, Berkeley. Okay, and this guy, I mentioned his name, Elata, who was my first contact, he went to MIT. And when I came, those people were already for two or three years back. And they were populated, the academic staff. And so there was an atmosphere of enthusiasm, research to research. Everything was in English, you know, complete split separation from the old style European technical school. And uh, before moving forward, I want to mention that one of the first things I did at the Technion was I wanted one of my works published in Romania. I, I thought it was good enough to be published in the West. So I translated a very painful work with help in French. Uh -huh. And I published it in La Ouille Blanche. It was a work about that uh, um, uh, intake by grill. Uh, it was. Uh, Alimentation de haut par grill par dessous, something like which means. And uh, at that point, I also changed my name. Ah. From Romania, my name was, my, nick, uh, my first name was Guido. Guido. And my last name was Dreamer. And then I don't want to go into that. It was at that time very fashionable in Israel for people from different parts of the world to. to get Hebrew names, so it was part of the ideology, no, no more. And uh, I thought, well, that's the right time to do it. My brother, who lived in Israel for 12 years already, he changed his name, so I adopted his family name. And my first name was Guido, and uh, Gidon is a Hebrew name, Gideon is a biblical name, they were re somehow related. So. I changed my name, and I wanted already to start publishing with my new name, not to have confusion. And uh, so when I publish it, my name in French is Gédéon, which is written with E, G-E-D-E. -E. So this is the way I wrote it. And then when I moved to English, it's the only paper written in French, one and first and the last. I. I wanted to keep the same spelling, and I found in a Columbia dictionary that in English you can spell it this way, so the common spelling is with an I. So this is the story of my starting. I see. So, but so you mentioned before your study, your early study on Paul's media, but that that was wasn't part of your PhD, right? That that came later, or it was already? A no, no. Uh, my PhD. What happened was that. Uh, uh, after 
maybe four or six months, Bear, Jacob Bear, realized that uh, I am um, able to do some uh, original research. By the way, we also worked with the Healy Show model. Have you seen in your life such a thing? Yes, uh, yeah. Teachers, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So I did experiments my, with a technician. Uh, and here I have a, a funny story. Uh, this Healy Show of the Costal Aquifer of Israel, so cross-section of the Costal, uh, it, it was not on scale, it was distorted. The vertical scale was much smaller or larger than the, the horizontal one, because if it were maintained the same scale, it would have looked like a yeah. long uh, snake, you know. So it was, uh, uh, I think, 1 over 40, the ratio between vertical and horizontal. So I asked Bear or whoever, I don't think, Bear, what is the uh, reason behind it? He said, you can show that if the aquifer is anisotropic, we know that, you can model it as an isotropic one by a scale change. We know you, you transform the equation into Laplace equation by scaling with the ratio of square root of uh, 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 of k uh, k vertical over k horizontal. So uh, so he told me we know that this is uh, aquifer anisotropic. So we use more or less the ratio we know. But this was not I mean this was not the case because it is not so easy to measure anisotropy. And in fact, much later. Another guy who did experiments with the interface based on, he found the best matches for iso isotropic aquifer. So it is like a joke because these are tailored according to the dimension of the room. <laughs> this ratio, not because there were physical reasons behind it. So Bear said, look, uh, what you are doing can be made into a PhD thesis. It was DSC, Doctor of Science. Uh, so why not registering? And in fact, you don't have to do, you have to do what you are doing anyway, but just to put it together in a thesis. So I enrolled for a PhD, but still I got a salary, not, not as an assistant, but as a research engineer, which was a better salary. And uh, so there were, Everything I produced got uh, was a report for Tahal, a paper, and then put together. Uh, I wrote a thesis, the same stuff. Okay, so, the same. so uh, uh, in the same time, uh, you, uh, on a more personal level, uh, you, uh, I mean, established a new life in uh, Haifa. So, can you tell us uh, something? Yeah, more about that? well, uh, because. Uh, <laughs> I arrived in February 62, and in December 62, I got married. Wow. <laughs> so it was a very <laughs> quick, uh, quick job. Very fast. Very fast. Uh, very different from uh, present days. <laughs> <laughs> My daughters were married. Uh, they had a kind of uh, testing period, testing very long period. testing yeah, period. Sure. Yeah, but uh, those times, and I, I came, I was, uh, quite lonely there in Haifa. Anyway, I met my wife, you know her, Ora. She was Israeli born. So, but again, my Hebrew was very uh, useful. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> in uh, this respect. <laughs> and uh, it was not only, so I, get, I got married and started a family. But also, uh, people who came from Romania, like myself, they came with a, with a big, a case with 70 kilos of old stuff. No money, no, just started from, from zero. I mean, I didn't have, I didn't inherit anything. My parents also, they came a few months after me and they have also to start from scratch. So it was also a time and my wife worked. She was a social worker and both had salaries and started to save. And uh, we bought a small but very nice small apartment with, the, uh, with mortgage, of course. And, uh, but at that time, with two salaries, you could pay a mortgage and become time. an owner of a small apartment after a few years. 
this is not possible today <laughs> anymore. Uh, so, but anyway, so it was, and then after uh, uh, two years, three years, yeah, in 65, I bought a small car, which was a Fiat 600. Fiat 600, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it was a period of really of building, building a, uh, a degree, building a career, yeah, building yeah. a family, yeah. and uh, settling down. So it was, but I, it was one of the happiest periods in my life. First of all, the happiest day of my life was when I landed in Israel. And then it was a very good period of creativity, of uh, settling down, of creating friendships. It was a very, very good period. And so back to science, uh, after graduation, after your PhD, so what, uh, how did you uh, continue, I mean, with the research? And, uh, uh well, what happened was that even during my PhD, in parallel with the work I did for my, for uh, this uh, uh, seawater intrusion project, from which uh, two or three papers came out. And not only the one on the hodograph, also a paper which was published later in uh, 67 on uh, also still cited. It was a paper about upconning, uh, uh, a well pu pumping above an interface and upconning. And uh, this was my, part of my PhD and published also again together with Jacob Baer. But uh, I still have some free time. And because I went to this subject of free surface flow, I did some work which was not part of my PhD, and I published on myself, on my own, which was not easy, but I could. And uh, so I started to publish, um, for instance, to, and then in 64, I got acquainted with a new book called Perturbation Methods in Fluid Mechanics by Milton van Dyck. It was fresh from the oven for some reason. And then I learned about these methods of what's called matched asymptotic expansions. And I, start, I was the first in Israel to, to use that method. And I applied it to flows of porous media about Dupuy assumption. I showed that you can obtain Dupuy assumption for flow towards the well by separating the flow zone into zones one near the well in which I use linearized approximation of the free surface and one far in which the pre-assumption work, and I could show you can match them. That line didn't get too much po uh, popularity in uh, hydrology. Mm. So these words are not frequently cited. Uh, so by I finished my PhD in 64. In 65, in the spring of 65, I got at the ceremony, and I have a nice picture with myself in the dress with a hat, and my wife was near me. She was pregnant <laughs> with a relatively big belly because it turned out later that those times you didn't know beforehand that she had twins. So in 65, I got a PhD and I got two daughters. Uh -huh. And um, uh, one of, again, a kind of a humoristic side, very soon after the birth, I started to go to my office and people told me, and it was in the summer, so there was no need, I mean, I was not, people told me, why do you come to the office? You probably are very tired. And I told them, that's the only place I can rest. <laughs> so it was... <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and um, then I was offered a tenure track position in 65 at Technion. At 65? Yeah, after, immediately after finishing my PhD, uh, as a lecturer, which was, uh, and in fact, in a few months, I got a position of senior lecturer, which is a kind between assistant professor yes. and associate professor, and uh, I got tenure. In a few months? Yeah, because, uh, yeah, at that time, they were, it much easier was, it much easier than today, and I was not a new person. I was already three years in the system. They knew me, they wanted me. So I, 
and I started my own career. And then the, the year after, in 66, you had your first visit abroad, right? Yeah, in 66, my first visit to USA, followed in 67 by one sabbat my first sabbatical of one year sabbatical. And uh, those visits, especially my sabbatical, was very uh, important for my further formation as a scientist. And so maybe I will talk a bit about it. Sure. Yeah, in 66, what happened was that uh, quite well known at the time, <coughs> and not only at the time, for many years, scientist called Don Kirkham, he was a professor at University of Iowa at Ames. Very famous soul physicist. He got the Wolf Prize later on, and he, because he was like first, he and Gardner were the first ones who put soil physics on a kind of uh, scientific basis, rather than uh, you know agricultural uh, discipline. And he had a project from the Atomic Energy of USA about uh, moving of solids to the unsaturated zone. <coughs> they were isotopes uh, using, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember even the motivation, but this was. And he had a PhD from Israel, his name was Asafsky, who became a professor at Technion, who was already back in Israel. So he offered him, uh, he told him, I have a project, maybe you can come for two months to work on this project, I have money. But he didn't, he couldn't or didn't want it for some reason. He he wrote, wrote at the time, you wrote <laughs> to Kirkham, I cannot, but maybe you are interested, there is another young uh, researcher here who may be interested in, uh, about me. So Don Kirkman invited me. And I spent two months at Ames, Iowa. It was a good experience for me because the first time in abroad, I mean, I didn't leave Romania or Israel. Romania, I couldn't, Israel, I, I was too busy. So it was like first time to open my eyes. But there is a, a first chapter of that was that in 65, the Technion was visited by an American scientist, young, he was in late, his late 30s. His name was Marshall Tulin. Now, the reason he, he was the vice president or co-owner of a research company in USA called Hydronautics, near Washington, D.C. And he came to Israel because the same guy, Elata, who was the first one I met in the Technion, was working on, uh, on a topic called drug reduction by polymer additives in water. It turns out a very small amount of polymers can reduce drag in pipes, or more important, along ships and submarines. So there was and still is a lot of interest in that. And the US Navy invested money in research. And he was doing this. And this company in the USA, they have a big project on that. So Marshall Turin came to Israel to find out what's going on there in Israel. He's also Jewish. So he had some interest also. And uh, he was at the Technion in our lab or our department and uh, but and he gave a lecture on his work now he's a brilliant scientist and he did theoretical work also very good mathematics background from MIT he did work on what is called super cavitating flows so you have a body in water like a torpedo or a wing moving very fast and it creates a big bubble behind it and so it's a cavity, and that's called supercavitating flow because it has to be high speed in order to create that bubble. And he studied the shape of that bubble and so forth by mathematical model, and he gave a, a lecture on it. And I was startled because it was very elegant, very different from what people were, around me were doing. And somehow, related to what I did on free surface mount policy media because I started to publish those papers on free surface mount no, and right. drains yeah. and I was also using complex variables and he used complex variables conformal mapping and so forth. So after that lecture 
I approached him and I told him, look, I had done something similar. It's porous media, but the methodology is very similar. And I gave him my report, which was not yet a paper. It was a report about mounds recharge on an area of the groundwater mounds. Groundwater mounds. Published uh, later in geophysical research. And uh, maybe you have some interest in it. To my surprise, he came back to me and told, I read it, it's very interesting, I like it. So maybe, and we started to talk about it. He wanted, he was a curious mind, how, how sick working groundwater and so forth. And by the end of his visit in Israel for a month or two, he told me, look, maybe if you come to USA, come to visit us. So at the end of my visit in Iowa, I flew to Washington, D.C., where, and then I went to this company, was in a small town, uh, some half an hour from between Washington and Baltimore, and I gave a seminar. And then we talked, and he said, look, if you want to come here for a sabbatical for one year, you are welcome. He offered me a nice salary at the time. And so in 67, I took a sabbatical leave and I moved with my wife and the two, Family. yeah, two little daughters for one year there. And this was a tremendous experience for me. Of course, I got acquainted with the English and uh, it was, that was very good because my, I, my speaking was not that good. But this is not the main point. The main point was that the research in such a company is completely different from research in university. The atmosphere is different. People do not stick to one. In the university, you generally stick to one area in which you try to create yourself a reputation, a name, you know, to put a mark. There is very flexible because these companies live only from, uh, from um, funded research, from outside. And you have to chase topics and uh, where m the money is. Of course, this has become common universities as well, well, but not at that time. At that time, universities were more academic. They still got money from different, uh, like uh, NSH or uh, ONR, on the Office of Naval Research or the Air Force. But they gave money for basic research. They don't, didn't care so much about applications. They thought it's important, basically, to have basic research, which, and, uh, but the companies, now this uh, Marshall Tulin, who was the co-owner and the other one, both have worked before for the Office of Naval Research. And they were monitoring research in universities. They were like the supervisors of the sponsor, being themselves scientists. So at a certain point, they said, why should we supervise other people? Why not doing ourselves research? And in USA, research can be done by private companies. It's, it is the Israel also, but it's more development. You know, they have, you have these startups. So they created this hydronautics company with a good, they have very good relations with ONR, with Office of Israel. They got projects. But Tulin was interested to expand their horizons. So I'll tell you, he started to work that time, I mean, to initiate research on desalination. Mm, at that time? At that time was like membranes for desalination. Now, that for uh, he, they, they worked for a few years on that. They couldn't get any more support. The company, by the way, was dismantled. But this idea and now has become one of the main developments in water resources in Israel and elsewhere to use desalination. So uh, Tulin, his role in this company was really like, a, uh, like in a hunting. He was a dog running <laughs> ahead. He was going to meetings. He was trying to find out what, where are things moving. Then he was doing research by himself, but only just like to create a niche to learn the topic, to do some work, to write a proposal, to get money, and then to give the work to somebody else and start to look around for something new. And because he was very talented and very good scientist, he, he could do it. 
But from my perspective, what happened was that suddenly I was asked to work in completely different topics. So I worked in, during that year on plastic flow of clay beneath a rotating wheel, which again was related to a project of the US Army of vehicles moving in, uh, you know, in uh, rough terrain, in terrain. And I, 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 in three months, I learned about it. I published a paper in a journal called Journal of Terra Mechanics. But it, <laughs> it stays there forever. Then I did research on traffic flow. It turns out that cars moving on a road, you can model them as a fluid. And that was not my idea, but the idea of a famous uh, flea mechanicist from Caltech. But Tulin wanted maybe to get some work in that area. So I learned that topic. It didn't materialize in a paper. But then as a technical, I taught for a couple of years a course on traffic flow, because I was the only one knowing something, anything about it. Uh, then, but the main work was on water waves. Didn't do anything on uh, porosmia. Water waves and naval hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics of bodies moving through water. Because they had an ongoing project from INR to do basic work on that. And, um, and uh, what happened is that, again, the tools were very similar, but the problems are, of course, not exactly the same. Uh, I did work on that. It, we published it with, with Marshall Tulin in Journal of Fluid Mechanics, a few papers. And uh, by the time I went back to Israel, he told me, look, if you want, you c we can work together. Because I established also a personal relationship of friendship and collaboration with him. You can work for us as a consultant in Israel. And let's keep working on, on this projects, project of basic research on free surface flow. So I came back to Israel with a very nice, uh, in a very nice situation because I, I work as a consultant. I got, a, of course, a part salary, but from USA. And uh, out of that, a few papers, again, uh, one of them uh, was uh, published in um, John Fried Mechanics is also, uh, yeah, in 1972, we published a paper on uh, the free surface in front of a blunt body and the stability of that free surface and how it breaks. And he, it was cited 34 times, and last time in 2011. Two so mm -hmm. it was last year still cited. Um, now, to finish this, I have to say that working with Marshall Tulin had a profound influence on my further uh, attitude or uh, style of work. Because what I learned from him is that the way to do research is on a problem is, first of all, to understand it. Now, this sounds quite trivial, you know, so but trivial. it is not so trivial. You have to, first of all, to get the essence of the problem, to understand where is the problem, what is the point, the important points. And for this, you, you do it intuitively before you start to use your pen and paper or your computer these days. And, uh, and he was very good at it. And I tried to emulate him. And, and this is what I did afterwards all my uh, research career and even now, before I am trying to solve a problem, I am trying to understand it. I went back to the Technion in 68. In 69, I was promoted to associate professor. And uh, the next year at the Technion, I devoted to two topics. Two fields. One was flow through porous media, groundwater hydrology, and the other one was uh, this in parallel. in parallel free surface flow, uh, like water waves and bodies moving through water. Naval, what is called naval hydrodynamics, and uh, I published uh, in both areas. I also got, I started to advise 
students, maybe I will talk about it uh, a bit later, but anyway. And uh, <clears throat> so, and I diversified my research in porous media in groundwater. I started to work on already in 66, but on, um, on uh, dispersion, on mixing, so two fluids, mixing fluids. And I published uh, a few papers with one of my students, Eldor, on uh, mixing, for instance, the interface by using boundary layer theory. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, then I continued publishing on free surface law, on water table. It is a paper, again, which is still cited because uh, because it was published, I think, in uh, 72 in WRR. It was about a method of identifying anisotropy, vertical and horizontal, uh, from, pumping tests. from pumping tests. And it was Shlomo Neumann has expanded it a few years later to incorporate also uh, elasticity, storativity. And his paper has become uh, a like a, a code using codes to in pumping tests, and uh, so he, what he did was really uh, he got that uh, impact of sortivity, which works very short time after start pumping. Immedi immediately, shortly after the uh, pumping draws water from the water table, and then it becomes a solution. I developed the time, and it was used in a few places in the world. But I diversified. I worked on, uh, uh, I said, I had already dispersion in 72. Boundary layer paper was cited 32 times. I worked on the influence of the unsaturated zone on pumping with another PhD student, which also was cited 25 times on the time. I, I work on stability of uh, fl fluid heated from below in a porous medium. Uh, I in, uh, in 78, although published in 78, it was work done while I was in the Technion on uh, solution of flow to in Packer and Slug tests, which was also cited 45 times after that. Uh, so, by that time, uh, in that eight years period, I published a number of papers in uh, groundwater hydrology and also in uh, free surface flow and groundwater mostly in WRR, in water resource research, and those in free surface flow in journal fluid mechanics. Okay. You, you mentioned before students, so we yeah. started advising students at the time, so what... Uh, uh, Yes, this is one of the, uh, I start, the, in Israel the system is different from USA in the sense that we don't have too many graduate students, maybe it's like Italy. In USA they get a lot of students coming from everywhere. So it's very common for a professor to have uh, 10 students, five, 10 students like PhDs and masters. In Israel, if you have one or two, that's more or less the norm in our field at least. So I had, during the eight, eight years, three PhD students and a few masters. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the, the disadvantage is that you are impacting less people and also your productivity, in, yeah. as far as it depends on having students, is lesser. But there are two advantages in my, or three advantages in my view. One of them was that the, there is very close collaboration in fact, I remember a fam famous um, Israeli scientist from Weizmann Institute uh, who became president of the state, his name was uh, Katsir. He described once this relationship like one of an apprentice and a master in med med medieval times, you know, when an apprentice was working with his master and learning from him. So this is something, a kind of very close relationship. The other thing is that we really got the best ones. Very few who were motivated. 
they didn't study to, to, to earn more money because there was not more money in that. So we got, and uh, the third is, as I said, that created a personal relationship which lasted. It's not like a Chinese guy who comes, uh, take PhD and goes and you don't hear about him. Also in USA, also people are still in contact with me. So, and two of them have become very well established scientists. One of them, his name was Stiasny, who worked on, um, on water waves. He became professor at Technion and he has now a, is a leader in this field. He's already close to his retirement, but a leader in this field, in, in a worldwide leader. And the other name is Mualem, mm. maybe you have heard about also him. Famous. Yeah, who I worked with him on unsaturated flow and we published together on hysteresis, on uh, dependence of hydraulic conductivity on water content. And he, after PhD, he moved to, to agricultural uh, faculty in Rehoboth and he became also very well known. So I, had the, I was lucky to advise talented people who developed on themselves. And then you moved to Tel Aviv. Yeah. And uh, you, you were already a social professor? No. In the social professor, I was 69. In 1974, I got to the Technion, I was promoted to full professor. Full professor, oh, okay. In 1974. So I was 42 years old. Um, and uh, it was okay. It was five years after a social professor. So what and was the mo motivation for uh, Yeah. What happened is the following. that. At the beginning of the 70s, the Tel Aviv University, which was where we sit now, and was a new university, this campus maybe had only five buildings or something like that, was developing very fast. And uh, they decided, the university decided, its president was a physicist, well-known physicist, um, Yuval Neyman, they decided to open an engineering faculty. And they decided, so it was, Technion was the main technological university, e even today. And two other universities, the Ben Gurion in the south and Tel Aviv, decided to create engineering faculties, which were different from the Technion in the sense they were part of a, a campus which had everything, like liberal arts and, uh, and physics and mathematics. Technion had physics, mathematics, and chemistry, but no nothing else like literature or you know, art or uh, history. So here the, it, it became a faculty within uh, a much larger campus, which I think has some advantages because you have an environment which is less uh, focused, less technology. And then they also decided that this to make it somehow different from the Technion, to be more research-oriented. Research-oriented, so more graduate studies, and uh, they wanted very much the, to hire staff, academic staff, research-motivated. Research so in, uh, at that time, is when I returned in 74, I was already back from my second sabbatical, I won't talk about that sabbatical, I uh, uh, a graduate of the Technion a master, whom I know and took a PhD in USA. He came back and joined Tel Aviv University, and we met because he was in in, Neb in waterways, Neb hydrodynamics, and he told me, "Look, maybe you would like." They now just are looking around for young people, but also senior people, you know, but not senior who are at the end of their career, at the beginning or mid career, to develop new areas and maybe you would like to join. And then I decided to take this step. Uh, and, uh, and there are a few reasons. First of all, Israel is a small country and to work as a professor in, in engineering, there were only three places. So if I wouldn't have taken that, the meaning was to stay in the Technion forever. And the idea to not to stay forever in the same place after we being there 14 years appealed to me. You know. 
in the technion I was the, one of the youngest. Everybody was, almost everybody was older than me. In Tel Aviv it was the opposite. Most people were younger. So the idea to work with younger people appealed to me. They were enthusiastic and full of energy. And then there is a, a famous French saying, chercher la femme, which means <laughs> look for the, for the wife or for the woman. Uh, my wife was from Tel Aviv originally, and she felt in Haifa like in exile. She, <laughs> she liked the style of life of Tel Aviv, which you realize after being here uh, for, uh, it's different from Haifa at that time even more. So putting all this together, I, I carried, I took this step, which was a kind of bold, I wouldn't say bold, but Technion was very well established. And here they only began, so it's like, one can say gambling, but not gambling, I, because this position was with tenure from the beginning, it was not, uh, and uh, a, challenge. Uh, a challenge, a challenge. And, and by the way, they hired me uh, on the ticket of my work in naval hydrodynamics and water waves. Ah, okay. So and, uh, and I betrayed them <laughs> later on. Completely. But this is one of the advantages of uh, academic freedom. You can do whatever you want. Once you are, you got tenure and, and so. So that's, in 76, I moved to Tel Aviv and started. And it was a new beginning from not only geographically, but as we'll talk soon, also I switched into interest of my research. Yeah, because uh, I mean, the, the very first years of your stay here, the, the, you, you initiated uh, in a way this uh, new field, which was uh, uh, stochastic surface hydrology, which was in the, at the very beginning in those years. So, and uh, this is uh, something very uh, important. I mean, it's how, how did you start this, uh, this new avenue and uh, what was the motivation? Uh, uh, because you saw, I mean, this uh, new branch for the very beginning, so it's something uh, very important. Yeah, uh, what happened was that already at the Technion, in 74, I think, I started to think about this idea that these models of aquifers, of reservoirs, of, are too simplistic because they were homogeneous, like the Hilly Show, it was homogeneous. And um, the truth is, I don't remember exactly when was this sparkle and wh how did it come. And by the end of this talk, I will return to this because I will talk a bit about methodology of research. I don't remember. It came from the air. I think there was a paper by Yevdevich, who also was a quite well-known surface hydrologist at the time who wrote a kind of manifesto saying it is time, because they work with statistics, it's time for the groundwater people also to use statistics. <coughs> anyway, I started to get into that idea, and uh, it came from the air, I don't know. And then in 75, Alfries published his paper in journal, in water sources, which was about modeling one-dimensional flow in which the hydraulic conductivity was heterogeneous, and he used blocks, yeah. blocks of different very K. Very famous paper. Yeah, very famous paper, pioneering paper. So I saw it, and I already thought about it, and I immediately realized, wow, to solve that problem, you don't need the numerical, uh, you don't need blocks, you can do it analytically in, in, as a continuum. In 76, my first paper in WRR was on one-dimensional flow, and what I did was uh, to, to do the same work, but I did it uh, you know, continuous. So this was my first step. And from that point on, I kept publishing, working in this area until today. And uh, I abandoned the waterways and, and uh, ship hydrodynamics my last paper was published in 82, but practically already in 79 I stopped. It was my last paper, and uh, I concentrated on, on this uh, subject. 
and uh, my first major paper was published in 79, uh, Models of Groundwater Flow in Statistical Homogeneous Formations. It was parallel to, so it was 79. It was cited all 126 times since. And it was more or less in parallel to the first papers published by uh, Lynn Gelhar and, uh, yeah. and Al Gutier, and also by Fries and Smith. So these were the first uh, papers published in the subject, and we were the first people to work in parallel on, on these uh, topics. So um, you saw um, the, the beginning of this new discipline, so stochastic pseudology. So it was very, it became immediately very popular. And very, uh, so how do you explain, I mean, this uh, tremendous success of this? Uh, um, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, as I say, I abandoned the other field because really it was very exciting to work on a co completely new field, whereas ship hydrodynamics was a very well-established discipline. So in ship hydrodynamics, I was doing second-order effects, all kind of, you know, refinements. Here, there was a possibility to do things from the beginning, which is so to work on the conceptual level. Mm -hmm and it, it, to do, uh, let's say, simple things which are still new and important. That's a big advantage when you start in a new field. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I had to learn a lot, and this was stimulating because I had to, I knew some statistics, but not uh, as much as I needed, and geostatistics, and uh, uh, theory of heterogeneous media. So this was very challenging and uh, stimulating. And uh, uh, so I was very, and uh, of course, as I told you, at the time when I wrote my first papers, which were, let's say, more or less I followed uh, afterwards, uh, in, in, uh, this was a starting point, and there are still uh, uh, papers which are still, uh, maybe for historical reasons, they are cited. Uh, at that time, there was not too many people, so uh, maybe a handful. So this was very stimulating. But now, in science, you need luck also, because other people have, have already also started something new. But the big luck was that this field got tremendous uh, uh, development. It was the community grew very quickly. And uh, the question is, uh, which I, I didn't anticipate. What were the reasons? I think there are a few reasons. Uh, one of them was that the topic is very much related to groundwater pollution, as we know. And uh, saturated zone pollution. And uh, there was a surge in interest by especially in USA, but also in Europe, by government agencies on deterioration of groundwater quality. Groundwater was pristine always, best water, but pollution started. Uh, in then the big problem of uh, nuclear waste disposal, mm -hmm. which got a lot of money, and again were interested to learn about movement of nuclear uh, waste in the background, if they reach groundwater. So uh, there was, and as I mentioned already a few times in other lectures, uh, this is the only topic in which Hollywood produces two movie, produced two movies. One is Legal Action with John Travolta, and the other one, uh, Irene Brockovich with uh, Julie, uh, Julie, Julie Roberts. So it's a subject which was of public interest. And there was, uh, in, in USA, maybe or now el elsewhere, when there is money, f a problem which is of public interest, there is money for it, it attracts uh, research, researchers. This is one aspect. The other as aspect is that because the tools we started to use were much more advanced 
they were borrowed or parallel to statistical physics, to geostatistics, to uh, hetero, uh, science of heterogeneous media. These were modern subjects, let us say sophisticated, different from the old style hydrology, you know, uh, measuring uh, hydrographs or pumping tests. So it attracted young, bright people from the fields of physics, mathematics, people who, had, who didn't come from engineering field. And I think this was a kind of cross-fertilization which was very, uh, very uh, uh, positive, and, and uh, so altogether, in a few years, tens of people, now maybe hundreds or even before, started to work to publish and uh, coming with all kinds of ideas. So I found myself, like the other big uh, founders, like riding on a wave which grow bigger and bigger <laughs> and I was like a surfer, so <laughs> riding on a big wave uh, rather than they crashing into anonymity, uh, the opposite. And, um, and I think it's still uh, true even today, although when maybe at the end we'll talk about what, how do I see the development of the field. Anyway, yeah, this cool. is... Yeah, so, uh, so what were, uh, if you can summarize the stages of the uh, development of your, your research in this field, in stochastic hydrology, so... Uh, uh, well, uh, the easiest way, which I did, I when prepared myself for this talk somehow, the easiest way is to look publication and to see how these publications change their topic. But I think it will take quite a long time to do that, so maybe a few, uh, a few, like of uh, milestones related to publications. Right, right. Yeah. Before that, I must tell you that, uh, remind, tell you that when I moved to Tel Aviv, I also started to work part time, one day per week, at Volcani Institute, with my late, my friend, late he died in '91, Eschel Bresler who was the advisor of David Russo. So at that time, I was coming every Friday to Volcani, working to Eschel, and David was circulating around and also hearing about that. And uh, so Eschel was a very good soil scientist with a good physical sense, but of, he, did, he didn't know nothing about heterogeneity and stochastic modeling. So then we started to work together on uh, stochastic modeling of unsaturated flow and transport in unsaturated zone. And again, those works were relatively simple-minded compared to what you people are doing today, but they are still the foundation. And that was a very good uh, marriage, let me call it, because he brought this knowledge of field, what happened in the field, and I came with the tools. And uh, so one of the areas in which I worked uh, for uh, years until, practically until Yasha died, uh, was developing theory of uh, uh, stochastic theory of unsaturated flow and transport. But uh, if to uh, milestones, so, and these milestones also related to people I worked together with, which again, I, maybe I will go a bit on that later on. Uh, I wrote in 86, and everything was published in 86 is more than three years during the three preceding years, so it is much earlier. Uh, statistical theory of, from, uh, uh, of flow through porous media, uh, from port to laboratory, laboratory to formation, formation to regional scale. So in that paper, I think I create that uh, kind of delimitation of the three big areas in which we apply this, uh, like in the laboratory, at the pore scale, in the formation three-dimensional and regional two-dimensional. And that paper was cited 158 times since. In, uh, before that, uh, 
I, uh, I uh, wrote uh, in 84, I wrote a paper on transport in general fluid mechanics, which has become a kind of classic because it was cited 578 times since, and still frequently cited, in which I set the Lagrangian transport approach, which I already published about the video. In that paper, it was set in a kind of systematic and rigorous, and the first time also in an analytical framework introduced the uh, conditioning by measurements of transmissivity or conductivity and head at points on transport. Numerically, it has been done already, but not um, in this framework. Um, then, let me quote a few other so areas. Inverse problem in a stochastic framework published in 87 with Joram Rubin. I will come back to him a bit later. Time-dependent macro dis dispersion, which described how the macro dispersion grows with travel time, which was published in 88 and cited 226 times since. If non-ergodic transport, uh, WR 1990, uh, quote, cited 187 times, JFM 91, 120 times in that I separated again. The idea was pro, uh, forwarded by Peter Kitanidis in a paper in Journal of Hydrology, but I developed that concept about uh, relative dispersion relative to the centroid of the plume. Uh, upscaling, which Peter Indelman started in 93. Uh, impact of evolving scales, no, no integral scales, the scale are evolving was published in, in WR94. Then I moved to Wells. Everything what I said so far was about mean uniform flow, but very non-uniform flow, flow to Wells. This was already in uh, 96, and it was with Peter and yourself, that paper in that area. Then. With you, we worked on uh, mixing, so dilution. 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 This was in uh, 98. Uh, and then, in uh, 2001, I moved together with you, uh, and then joined by Igor Yankovic. In, so in 2001, there was a shift. Until 2001, everything which was done was uh, continuous and using essentially this assumption of uh, weak, weak heterogeneity, which is very helpful in solving problems and gives a lot of insight. But then I moved to, uh, with you, together with Igor, into the uh, topic of highly heterogeneous formations by a completely different model, which we still use, a model of blocks of different conductivities and uh, spherical blocks surrounded by a matrix. And that opened for us, and I hope also for others, new horizons because we could tackle problems in which, which are very important in practice, in which aquifers are uh, strongly heterogeneous. And we touched on the way problems like effective properties of heterogeneous materials. And uh, so this is ongoing. Uh, ongoing uh, uh, approach, and uh, uh, we uh, also, uh, maybe another topic which I, I, I skipped was, but which I developed uh, together with um, Vladimir Svetkovich was reactive, sarcasm of reactive flows by using travel time approach, which was promoted by, uh, in our, in hydrology, it's, in physics, it's, for a long time, <clears throat> by Vladimir and Alan Shapiro, and then we worked together and on two-phase flow and published in, a pros in a, uh, Proceeding for Our Society in JFM. So this is very quickly a few directions which is developed. Yeah. Now, back in uh, uh, 
the uh, 80s, so le le late 70s, 80s. In the late 80s, you decided to to write a book, yeah, which is a huge effort uh, usually. And uh, what was your experience? What was the motivation of writing a book? And uh, would you um, uh, recommend to uh, <laughs> such an effort? Uh, uh, well, um, you say books. Uh, are two kinds of books, let's say. They are monographs, which are scientific, in which you start, you somehow try to uh, bring new material, uh, to summarize new material, and they are, of course, textbooks. I was not, uh, my idea was not to write a textbook, although they are very important, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that to diminish their importance. But I felt already in the beginning of the 80s, that this new field is developing fastly, and for people who want to enter, and many people enter it, there is no kind of systematic summary of what was done so far to permit them to enter easily, let's say, easier. And then I came to this idea, of course there is also natural, uh, human, uh, that a book, you want to leave your imprint with a book, Though I prefer to write papers, not because this was a very serious effort. It took me ten years, practically. Ten years, maybe eight years, mm. ten years. And the reason it took so long was twice. One was that I didn't want to stop and do research, publish papers, and just to concentrate on summarizing what has been. So in parallel, I published quite a lot. So it was like my free time. Secondly, I took as a, as, a, as a line, I am not, everything I am writing there, I am going to prove it again. Of course, I, I was not going to prove mathematics, like uh, things which I took from mathematics, but everything in porous media, not to copy without redoing it, which takes a lot of time. But I was sure that what I am doing is correct and I understand it. It's not that I am taking a formula from somewhere saying a reference. I gave reference, of course, but I redid it. It's not that I reinvented them. I just wanted to make sure. And I wrote it in my way. Then there was another thing which made it uh, longer. Uh, it was an ambitious project because I wanted also to cover by stochastic method the poor scale, permeability, uh, poor scale dispersion to, to show, in fact, that you can, by a unified approach, to cover the poor scale, the formation scale, and the regional scale. And uh, that took a lot of time. The, and also the technical means by writing, I printed myself, of course, I didn't write by pen and somebody print, but the, the software was quite primitive at the time. And the, the Springer Verlag, which they uh, published the book, they, what they did, they photocopied, cut and pasted, and photocopied. And uh, so there are two things I regret un until today. One is that the, that part, the technical part, was not so good. But I was so tired at the end. I was so that uh, there are many typos in the book. I regret that. With the with the present day software, you know, you could spellers which check and so forth, and you can change easily. But by the end of this ten years, roughly ten years period, uh, from the beginning of the idea and starting to write until publication '89, uh, I was so exhausted that I didn't have the strength to do a careful uh, last time check. But Again, because I, it was the first book in this area, followed then by a book by Gelhar yeah. in uh, 93, and then Yoram Rubin in uh, 2003, I think. And uh, these are the three books. Because it was the first book, it, uh, it got, uh, it had an impact. It was uh, cited more than 1,200 times during this period. It was, uh, out of print uh, after uh, maybe five or six years because they printed maybe uh, 1,000 something copies. Not, these books are not very popular. And uh, 
and so this was the motivation and uh, this was the outcome I think that you your PhD was uh, you started and finished it more or less not finished it but uh, by reading the book right studying the book yeah I mean I st yeah I read the book during the first year where you every, every day like studying uh, yeah. I remember very well so it I was hope very you helpful for me I, yeah. I hope you don't regret uh, for having written the book because it was uh, actually for people like me, I mean, I was a yeah. student, I, it was very helpful for me, for my... Yeah, what I did also, the first chapter is introduction to stochastic, because this field is huge, yes. So I thought maybe people could news, know some statistics, but don't know the tools, specific tools, to get it in a nutshell, rather than going to mm -hmm. fed books of random processes, which are very difficult to, yeah. to read, so... It took me quite some time to go through the first uh, section, yeah. yeah, because it's... Uh, many, yeah, it's uh, condensed matter. Condensed and so, but there are many references, so I could follow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, re regarding uh, um, collaborations, I mean, during this year, say, you uh, collaborated with many people uh, from different countries, uh, so... Um, uh, how do you regard this collaboration? How do you feel about them? Uh, yeah, I wrote about it also in my biography in Groundwater. This was for me one of the most rewarding um, uh, aspects of my uh, career, of my research, because I had the luck to start to collaborate with young researchers, but who were already after their PhD. Young and not so young, Asher Bresser was not so young, he was a bit older than me, but as when we collaborated, we were both young. Uh, but I had this luck to, uh, to start to collaborate with young researchers who were already on their own, so they didn't need uh, guidance from me, but they were ready to collaborate, to, to exchange and so forth. And this came also in a period in which communication became much easier through email. And so, during my career, I will mention a few names, Eschel Bresser, of course, then Vladimir Svetkovic, and each of them now is very well established. Peter, the late Peter Indelman, who came from Russia, with a very good background, serious, solid background, in case you know him very well, and we started to work together after his immigration, to his, he came to work with me. Joram Rubin, who was my PhD student, I advised him, he moved to USA, and also we, we still worked, we worked for a while, I visited him on a sabbatical, and we published together for a few years afterwards. Then uh, yourself, and Igor Yankovic, and uh, besides the excitement of working with younger people, enthusiastic, and learn from them, and uh, helping them, all of them have become very good friends. And this is something maybe who, people who go into scientific careers, they don't realize that science is also a, a springboard to, to get close relationships with people who become your friends, although they are from different countries. And uh, so for me, this was one of the jewels of the prizes of my career, which I very much uh, value. So, uh, again, regarding uh, stochastic ideology, which is the field which is you contributed to initiate, uh, and uh, how do you uh, view the status of the field now, these days, uh, recently? Uh, well, I, I wrote a small manifesto in uh, EOS, I think in 2003, it was published, it was based on a lecture in 2002 in Berkeley, there was a meeting. Uh, and also I talked, I think, last year, uh, one and a half years ago in Monte Verita, we had a big meeting. Uh, my feeling is that the field has reached some kind of maturity. It is already, it's not a young uh, starting, it's mid-age, let's say which may be the symptoms of mid-age. Uh, many people work on it, established people, there are three books already, papers are produced at a steady uh, flow of papers in this area. Uh, so 
it is no more that kind of uh, uh, wild west in which you can discover gold very easily. Uh, so, but um, still there are many theoretical issues which need sol solution and uh, so there is room for doing that. Uh, in my view, the theory has advanced very fast and also on a wide front and in depth. In my view, the main problem, and here I, I see the development in the future, is how to bridge between theory and application. Because I mentioned before, one of the positive developments was joining of this uh, discipline by people for, with theoretical background from physics, from statistical physics, from mathematics, which was very positive. It brought the kind of science flavor to uh, engineering field. But the danger was that, and it is, that people became so fell in love with theory and that they somehow f forgot, may maybe, or were not aware that everything started from applications. I mean, it was a problem was not to develop new theories uh, of heterogeneous media, but how to uh, solve problems of pollution, of aquifer deterioration, of uh, uh, so, in my view, the, a divorce has been created be somehow between theory and applications, and uh, stochastic modeling hasn't penetrated the world of hydrologists who are solving problems on the field and so forth as much as uh, I'd have liked. And I think it's not easy. It requires from both sides from a kind of to adapt and uh, uh, and I think that the most important or pressing need now is to bridge as much as possible the gap and, and to bring these new concepts in to make them a kind of day-to-day -day, uh, tool so that's the main challenge I see And uh, maybe we can conclude with a few, gen few general uh, um, aspects of scientific activity. And uh, for example, uh, uh, what was your your method? I mean, do you have a particular method, scientific uh, method, uh, which you, you followed uh, in your career? And uh, um, what is your general reflection about the scientific methods itself? Which, uh, uh, well, here I, I want to we can talk about two things. First of all, the methodology, then about, let's say, how do I see it in general and myself, and then what are, let's say, my specific kind of uh, lines of work. As a method, uh, there is something I also wrote in my bi biography, is that uh, when I start, became a scientist and started to work, I thought science is a very methodic, uh, organized, rational, planned activity. You have a goal, you, you see what are the problems, you start to work on them, next year I'll work on this, three years from now on that, and you have like a boulevard open and you know you want to, or a mountain, you want to conquer it and you know 200 meters next year and, and so forth. But it didn't turn, that was my kind of uh, view and probably many people think that scientists are very rational so they were very organized and very planned. But it didn't work this way because ideas came, I don't know, from the air. I never knew more than maybe one or two years in advance what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I was embarrassed because at a certain point I became already known and young people came to me and said, what is, what should I do, what are you thinking about, what should be done uh, now and so forth, what are you working on? And I was embarrassed because I didn't have that vision, you know. Some people have it to say now, you know, from now on we have to do this and that and so forth. So I said, I don't know, I, I work on this, but I don't know, maybe it's, I was a bit 
Then in 88, I read this book, which is called Nature Obsessions, written by uh, Natalie Angier, or Anger, because she is now in America. Natalie Anger, she was a journalist, not a scientist. And she went to a very famous research institute in Boston called Whitehead Institute, working on cancer and molecular biology. So this was an institute which was a forefront of one of the most uh, hot areas of research. A lot of money, the best people were attracted even today. And she, her idea was to sit there for a year or so and to follow these people. How, how do they do research? Not as a scientist, but as a reporter. And to write a book, how scientists work. And this, not so, this is a 380-page book, quite interesting. She follows not only pers also personally how they interact and so forth and so forth. Now, the book has a preface written by a famous biologist at the time. He was a biologist and also a, a essayist wrote, who wrote science essays. He is no more alive. He was, I think, at the Rockefeller Institute, also very well known. His name was Lewis Thomas. And when I wrote it, his foreword, I felt a great relief because I realized that it is not only me who works in this kind of disorganized manner, but this is how people generally work. So I'll, I'll uh, quote him, I'll read from the book. A few lines, of course. There is, I suppose, a way of going about work of this kind that can be called the scientific method. But I have never been quite clear in my mind about what this means. Method, quote unquote, has the sound of an orderly, preordained, preordained step by step process. One maneuver leading sensibly and logically to the next. A beginning, a middle, and then an ending. I do not believe it really works that way most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, and he continues. And then he writes again, surprise is what scientists live for. And the ability to capitalize on moments of surprise, plus the gift amounting to something like, like rather like good taste, of distinguishing an important surprise from a trivial one are the marks of a good investigator. I like my, very much this idea because you is like noise. You hit a lot of noise, ideas, and read about something. But uh, if you are lucky and you are clever, let's say, you see there, there is a diamond there. Other people see a lot of earth and no diamonds. And that's what he says. And this comes by surprise. A uh, last uh, citation or quotation I want to, which is related to other, the, net, the network of science, he says at the end, works only because the people involved in research are telling each other everything they know out in the lobbies at the international congresses, in nearby bars and dinners, and by spontaneous long distance telephone calls. At that time, there was no email. Now it will be by emails. Telling the world, the scientific world, not the press, everything you know, including the unprecedented observation made yesterday in your laboratory, is a large part of the fun of doing science. So here again, if we talk about methodology, that things come to you like uh, by chance, but it's not pure chance and not planned. Then. I think also the being open, being ready to share things which are in the cooking, in the oven, uh, exchanging ideas, it's one of the positive and rewarding aspects of science. And I think in some sense, the good relation and this collaboration I created with young people like you, it was because I, I, I didn't care about talking about new ideas and so forth. I, I am telling this because sometimes you hear people are trying to keep things, you know, until they publish to keep them <laughs> close to their chest because they are afraid. Uh, 
of, and one of my aphorisms is that I will be happy that my stuff is stolen than the opposite, that it stays there and nobody pays attention to it <laughs> because it means it has some value, it is stolen. So this is about uh, methodology, but maybe now about my own uh, uh, approach is I think that we are very much influenced by our formation. And uh, I come from engineering school, although I also learned mathematics. By, by and large, I, I stayed as an engineer and I and, uh, doing in engineering science. And I think that has a certain flavor different from... Uh, the first one is that always in my mind, what I'm doing is somehow related to applications. Although things may look abstract, but it is, motivation is always from application. And ideas come from there, uh, not, you know, like pure mathematicians or mathematicians, which is completely abstract, or uh, basic physics, although they also are. But application not only by nature, but these things have to lead to something which will be used. So this is the back of, of my mind, and I think this has two implications. One of them is the one I talked about, the impact of Marshall Tulin about. I think that we have to understand and to simplify things as much as possible, to, to see the essence, because I think you cannot, it will be a disaster to try to apply a theory which is not well understood, which we don't understand the mechanism and the, the essence. And um, here I may use also a quotation, which I put it only recently, I fell upon it, and I put it in, uh, in my Skype, uh, which I like very much, and I think it's related to it, is what, uh, uh, from Saint-Exupéry, well, I wrote it down to, to, to quote it, but I don't find it. But anyway, um, he, what he says is that one attains perfection not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to remove. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the idea of simplicity. Perfection is not to create something very complicated but something which when you reduce and you stop, when really to reduce it more means that you start to lose. So this is one of, uh, and I think that this fact that we are, uh, I am motivated by application, engineering, coming from engineering, and, um, and uh, simplicity are somehow related. Then, uh, to give again uh, an idea about what means uh, perfection in saint exupery words, in a book from um, 39, Terre des Hommes, uh, means that you simplify rather than complicate, makes it complicated, is that my hero in science is G.I. Taylor, famous G.I. Taylor, who was not a hydrologist. And G.I. Taylor, everything he touched was like creating a new direction. Mm -hmm in science. And he was a very modest man in Cambridge, having a small lab. He was doing his own exper experiments. And he didn't use tensors, because he didn't know enough about them. He was, and he said, I don't, I, if I can do, uh, can uh, solve problems without tensors, I'll do it without tensors. <laughs> so I like this approach to use really. So this is more or less the way I I, uh, I did it, and uh, I think I still, this is a kind of concept I use. So, there's a closing question. Uh, uh, you got in your career many prizes and honors, awards, um, uh, very prestigious. Uh, so, what do you feel? Of course, you feel positive, but uh, what's your reflection on uh, awards and their role in uh, scientific um, activity? Well, um, I, first of all, I must say that uh, something which may sound a bit like uh, 
bragging. I never, either promotion in the university or prizes or awards, I never initiated them or tried to promote them, to push. And I'm not saying that as a kind of merit because I think it's perfectly legitimate for a person who feels that he deserves something to, to act in that direction. It comes from genetics. My father was also the same. It was very difficult for him to say, they owe me something or I deserve it. And I, I inherited this. It's very, it's, I have a difficulty, a personal difficulty to say, you know, I, sh I should be given this. Or So this has a the disadvantage, I can see, was maybe that I got these uh, awards and promotions later than otherwise, if I would have pushed hard. But on the other hand, some of them are surprises, which is very nice. To, like uh, when I got a hon uh, honorary degree from um, in Paris, in, uh, here in Marie Curie University, which was initiated by Guillaume de Marsili, I didn't know about it. Uh, the Stockholm Water Prize, I had some rumors because it was initiated, but I didn't really know what is going on and so forth. So, uh, so this was, uh, I, was very nice to, uh, to, and, uh, to say that I, I didn't like it or uh, I liked it a lot, I mean, and we are scientists, we are ambitious and we, we like to be recognized, but it was not that it burned into my, uh, into my uh, bones that I would push and try. For me, even today, um, the greatest satisfaction is still in the joy of research, of solving problems, discovering new things. And um, I regard everything as, as an outcome and never as a purpose which motivates, it helps of course, but doesn't motivate me to do what I'm doing. And I think creativity and the awards are correlated, but are not, none is the cause of the other. And uh, so now I think it is time to finish this and start to do some work, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, Guido, thank you very much for this conversation. Very, very nice and instructive. And, uh, and uh, we'd like to thank again uh, the Time Capsule program, project, uh, and uh, in particular, um, uh, Renard. Uh, Philippe Renard. Philippe Renard, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Philippe and Renard, who organized and, uh, this, and uh, uh, is taking care of this project. And also the technical staff, which. Technical staff here, of helped, course. And uh, helped, which, uh, helped us and are st still going to help us. <laughs> Thank you.